30 seconds into the video and I've already made a mess! Woo! Was it a smart idea to wear a white blouse? Nope. Hello everyone, welcome to another video. Today we're gonna talk about books, but we're just gonna do it a little bit different than usual, I, th I guess. <laughs> As you may know, I enjoy fooling around with some drawing, some painting, and this year I had a goal for myself to draw more often, just casually, so lately I've sometimes been drawing characters <laughs> from books that I'm reading. Actually a few weeks ago I started this drawing of Howl from Howl's Moving Castle, which is one of the books that I read and that we'll be talking about today, but I haven't gotten around to finishing it, so I thought wouldn't it be fun if we do it together, you know, we just cozy up together, talk about the books that I read in the past month, uh, while I also work on this drawing. Maybe that's a little bit more interesting than just staring at my face while it talks. I stuck a paper on there because I also use this as a diary. <laughs> I have absolutely no idea how to continue. There's still like pencil lines on this. I think the first thing that I need to do is just make the lines a little bit thicker, which actually brings me perfectly. Little segue into today's sponsor, which is Skillshare. I have actually been learning a lot of great new things since using Skillshare. If you don't know, Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of inspiring classes on design, photography, productivity, you name it, anything you want to learn. So going back to this piece, I knew that I wanted the character to stand out more from the background and because I've been following this class by Josiah Brooks on illustration, I now know that I should probably play around a little bit more with the line thickness. So that's what I'm gonna do. We are learning new things here. <laughs> anyway, the great thing about Skillshare is that it's also super affordable with less than $10 a month if you pay annually. And if you're like, mm, I think I wanna try that out for free first, you can by clicking the link in the description because the first 1000 people to click the link in my description will get a free trial of Skillshare Skillshare premium membership so you can explore your creativity. Okay, now let's put this into practice and start... I should probably start by erasing all these pencil lines and then we can start talking about the first book that I want to talk about that's on top here and that is Take a Hit, Denny Brown by Talia Hibbert. As you may know, I don't usually read a lot of romance books. Not that I have anything against romance, I mean I love romance when it appears in other stories, but I haven't had a lot of luck yet with just full-on romance books until I found out the books by Talia Hibbert, the Brown Sister series. The first one is Get a Life, Chloe Brown, and the second one is Take a Hint, Denny Brown. And let me tell you, these books have converted me into romance reader um, <laughs> this one is about Danny, who is this PhD student who's like very much like, I don't want a relationship, it just ruins everything, you know, feelings, oh yikes, no, we're not doing that, we're focusing on our career. And then one day there's this fire drill going on at her university and one of the guards heroically rescues her from the elevator, like carrying her in his arms, basically as you can see on the cover here. Some of the students took pictures of it and it went uh, viral. Without spoiling anything, they kind of find out that it's kind of beneficial to both of their lives to, you know, have people think that they are in this very famous relationship that's getting a lot of attention all over the internet. So they're like, you know what? Let's just continue faking this relationship and reap the benefits. But of course, we will not fall in love but of course we all know how these things go. It's a fake dating romance, which I love, one of my favorite tropes, and it was just so nice. Like, this book is exactly everything that I want from a romance, and that is that it's kind of like equal parts cute, but also still steamy, but also like genuinely you end up loving the characters and getting to know a lot more about what they're doing and what their lives are like. It's never cringy, it's never over the top, but also like the tension remains there throughout the entire book, which is just wonderful. There's no annoying like miscommunication or things that go wrong that just makes you want to like tear your hair out because the characters are acting stupid. None of that happens. It's just good fun all the time. I should probably start drawing instead of waving this eraser around all the time. I know that a lot of people that read the Brown Sisters books really like Take a Hint Denny Brown, this book, a lot more than the first book in the series. And personally, 
I didn't really notice a difference. Like I liked both of the books an equal amount. So just like Get a Life Chloe Brown, I gave Take a Hint Danny Brown four stars. I thought it was just a good time, a good time. Sometimes you read a book that's just a good time and that's what this was. Okay, moving on to another book that was really just a good time. And that is the book um, that I'm basing this drawing on. Uh, Howl's Moving Castle by Diana Wynne-Jones. This is the book that the Ghibli movie was inspired by. Um, if you don't know, you know, the Japanese animation Ghibli movies. I love them. And Howl's Moving Castle is actually one of my favorite of those movies. Um, and I heard a lot of great things about the book. So I was like, you know what? I should finally pick up the book. And I am so glad that I did. I feel like there's a specific subgenre of fantasy that is very different from the typical like epic fantasy you know if you read books if i read books like the poppy war darker shade of magic other popular books like brandon sanderson wheel of time they're like epic fantasy howl's moving castle is one of those brand of books that to me kind of fits more in the fantasy books like the night circus that are just cozy fantasy like, they're definitely fantasy. This story takes place in just a completely made-up fantasy world. I mean, our main character meets the witch and gets turned into an old lady, <laughs> after which she then goes on this journey to find the wizard in a castle on feet that moves around. There's a fire demon in the hearth that keeps the castle moving. Definitely a lot of fantasy elements, but it still feels super different from like epic fantasy because it just feels more fairy tale like way more cozy. We just follow the story of this girl Sophie who is trying to break the curse to get back <laughs> into her normal like young woman body. Throughout the book <laughs> I, I'm just realizing now that I'm trying to explain the plot that there isn't really a clear plot other than just weird things are happening. <laughs> There's a specific kind of atmosphere that is to Ghibli movies. You know, if you've ever watched a Ghibli movie, you probably know what I'm talking about. I don't know how to describe it, but it's just this magical but rooted in reality feeling. And that feeling is exactly what you get from this book. It just has the Ghibli, it has the Ghibli feel, so I totally understand why they took this story to turn it into a movie. Because what I will say, the story is very different from the movie. It starts out the same, but then it deviates completely, completely new story. So that's actually super fun because you get to experience a completely new story if you read this book. If you like fantasy because you're like really into epic fantasy, I don't think this is gonna, you know, like fulfill all your needs. But maybe you should just try it out, you know? Maybe you also like different kinds of fantasy. And if you're the type of person that's like, I don't know if I like fantasy, you know, those epic fantasies aren't really my thing, then maybe this might actually be the type of magical fantasy that you've been looking for. I think I ended up giving it four and a half stars. The only thing that wasn't super fulfilling is that the characters, although they are very fun to read about, all remain a little bit shallow, but that's all. Uh, everything else, great. <laughs> then let's talk another <laughs> about another book that I finally finished <laughs> after it's been on my TBR for four years or something. It is my boy, Neverwhere by Neil Gaiman, an author that I've only read Caroline from him, but I really want to read more of him because he feels like the kind of author that I would like. Also, again, that's another example, I think, Neil Gaiman, of fantasy books that are more kind of like cozy, magical, instead of like epic, you know? So I picked up Neverwhere, which is the only Neil Gaiman book that I own, that I also started like three, four years ago and never finished. But I finally finished it, listened to it on audiobook, and I was like, if I listen to it on audiobook, then maybe I'll like it more and I'll be able to get through it quicker. But alas, the joke's on me, I still didn't like it. Premise of Neverwhere is pretty cool. We have our main character, Richard. He's... well, we'll get to that. <laughs> he has a very normal life, very mundane, nothing interesting really happening, just like, you know, 9 to 5 office job, a very rich 
girlfriend but it's kind of dubious whether they actually love each other or not and then one day he rescues this girl called Dor and since the moment he's rescued her suddenly people kind of start forgetting about him and people don't know oh my god I just realized that this sounds very similar to the plot of <laughs> the invisible life of Addie LaRue. Context. This is one of V. Schwab's favorite books. We know that the A Darker Shade of Magic series is kind of inspired by this book because it takes place in this world below London. London below, which is like a magical version of London underneath London. So you can see the inspiration. But I also just realized that she probably got inspiration for The Invisible Life of Eddie LaRue because the main character is like forgotten by everyone around him. Nobody knows who he is. Now the only place that he can go to is London Below where the girl he rescued is also from. And it's just this below London place with kind of like magical red people. <laughs> among other things and he just goes on this quest to helping this little girl and also getting back to like London above and going back to his old life and he goes through all these like little adventures it's one of those books where there's a lot happening all the time but I just didn't care I just didn't care and I think one of the main reasons is that I absolutely despised the main character Richard <sighs> Where do we even begin? He's just kind of annoying. <laughs> and I know he's supposed to be, okay? He's supposed to be kind of annoying, very naive, constantly doing things wrong all the time. And that's his thing, I'm aware. That's the kind of character he's supposed to be. That's not necessarily a flaw in the book because of course your main characters need to be flawed. But this man's particular flaws just really grated me. And one of the big things that I noticed with this book is that the main character's motive are just diametrically opposed to the motive that you have as a reader and that is that our main character Richard all the time he was in London Below was like I need to go back. I need to go back to my wife who doesn't love me. I need to go back to my boring, boring lifestyle. And as a reader you're like no, stay here, stay in London Below, it's way more interesting. <laughs> I don't want to see you succeed and that's kind of a problem when at least to me, if I as a reader don't even want to see the main character succeed because I don't agree with his motive, you know, you kind of stop caring about the story pretty quickly. So I think that's the main reason why this book just didn't vibe with me, even later into the story when a lot of interesting things were happening and the main character's motive also changed a bit. I just couldn't get myself to care because I was never really attached to any of the characters. That just happens to me sometimes when I'm reading a book, usually fantasy books that are really cool, like the concepts are really cool, cool things are happening all the time. But if the author failed to make me care about the characters, then that just doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter anymore. I'm making very wobbly lines here. Dude, I'm already on like the second to last book and I've only just created a thicker line around how <laughs> on my drawing. This is not really going very fast. I think I need to color in his hair. I don't want to do that because I hate drawing hair. I'm really bad at it and I'm pretty happy with how it turned out now. Like it never looks like this. <laughs> so I'm afraid to color it in but his hair is black so we just gotta do that. <laughs> and it will also create a little bit more contrast which this illustration needs right now. Before we move on to the last book that I did not plan on reading this month, but I did read, which was a reread of Six of Crows, I want to talk about the book that I read in March. In March, I didn't upload a reading wrap up. And that's because I only read one book in the entire month of March. So I thought, you know, I'll just take up that book into my April wrap up. And the book that I spent the entire month of March reading was Dune by Frank Herbert. I started reading it <laughs> because I was watching Raya and the Last Dragon and the person I was watching it remarked that it was kind of reminded them of like Dune 
with all the sand and then I rewatched the trailer for Dune and I was like oh man I'm excited for this movie it looks so cool and I was like you know what I want to read the book right now impulse decision I was like I'm gonna read this 600 page epic sci-fi fantasy dance story right now and so I did and it took me a month <laughs> Oh, I'm either going to ruin this by coloring it in, or it's going to look better. And that's a risk you're always taking. <laughs> anyway, and while I was reading Dune, I decided to make a drawing and I was like, you know what? Maybe I'll record this so I can show it in a video. So I don't know if this is like interesting to anyone. I know that like speed drawings are especially interesting to watch if you're like a really good artist. And I know that I'm not like a professional artist but like I enjoy doing that so here's a speed drawing of me drawing a character from Dune while I'll give you my review of Dune let me know if this is interesting or if you would rather look at my face the whole time okay we're just experimenting today so Dune is a sci-fi fantasy story that takes place on this planet called Dune humans have colonized this planet because there's this organism that lives there that only grows on Dune which is called spice and it is the vital drug for space travel enhancing your powers etc so everyone wants the spice so everyone wants to rule over Dune and we follow our main character Paul who is the heir to the family that is currently ruling over Dune but through a long chain of events and backstabbing and betrayal he and his mom have to flee like the capital city and go just right into dune into the sand fields where they meet with the free people that live in the sand that are not in the city they are called the fremen and they start living with them they learn how to live with this world how to um, fight the giant worms that live there, how to make sure that they can survive without water. This is what's on the back of the book, but it takes like half the story for the story to actually start happening. Like the first half of the story, I'm gonna be honest, was pretty boring to me. It was mostly just political intrigue, which already isn't my favorite thing, but I will admit that I actually kind of enjoyed it in Dune. It's just that it takes way too long for like the important first plot points to happen so you're reading the book and constantly you're just like okay but like when is the story gonna start when is the story gonna start and then halfway into the book the story finally starts taking off and then it gets really cool in my opinion the best part about dune was the world building you can tell that frank herbert really put a lot of effort and love into giving you every little detail about this world but it was never in a way that annoyed me like i loved learning about how <laughs> the ecology of the world works like how the lack of water influences how the people view the world and the religions that they have super interesting uh which is gonna make a lot of fantasy and sci-fi fantasy fans very happy personally that's never enough for me to really love a book but i definitely very much appreciated it. I also really appreciated how they handled the chosen one trope. It's one of those books where it takes a very religious turn, which I personally find a lot more interesting than just making the chosen one a hero. And I, f I find that I don't see this enough. Like I've only seen it in Dune and <laughs> Shadow and Bone so far. There's a lot of really cool action scenes in this book and after I finished it after a month I really felt like I was there. Like sometimes you read a fantasy book and you just... it, it all feels so real. It feels like I've seen a movie. But I've just been reading a book all this time but I feel like I just know this world of Dune so well and I really appreciate that. But I will say I really struggled through the first part because it just took so long for the story to actually start happening and also the characters were never really the strongest point of this book which I know is not wasn't really the point of the book like it was supposed to be a very world building heavy story but again not usually very much my taste oh and the last thing that i want to say is i know a lot of people have been saying that you can read this book as a standalone even though it's part of a seven book series um do you like the ending is so open-ended i didn't feel fulfilled after reading this book but I didn't like it enough to want to like continue seven more of these thick books 
but I do still have so many questions and I personally didn't think that the story really wrapped up nicely at the end. Like, there's, it's definitely an open ending, like, it's definitely the first book in a series, at least in my experience. Um, so overall my thoughts are positive. I think I gave it three stars. I'm really happy that I read it. I really appreciate it for what it is, but I'm not, like, blown away by it, you know? <laughs> okay, I finished the hair. I think it does look better. It does look better. I'm I'm glad that I made this decision. <laughs> Next up, what are we gonna do? What are we gonna do while we talk about Six of Crows? I can add a little bit of detail, but I'm afraid I'm gonna like ruin it. The goal was to just draw casually. I'm just gonna take a risk here. Maybe I ruin it. Maybe it'll get better. We'll see. Anyway, so my plan was never to reread six of crows this month but as you may be aware the show shadow and bone dropped which i really loved it definitely wasn't perfect but oh was my little fangirl heart happy and the great thing about the show is that it doesn't actually follow the story of six of crows it's just a prequel story with the same characters so after i finished the show for like a one and a half time <laughs> I watched a few episodes again. I was like, okay, but I want more right now. I really want more. And the Six of Crows storyline pretty much perfectly like continues where the show ends. So I was like, well, if I want to continue the story, I could just reread the book. And I've been holding off on rereading Six of Crows for years because I'm gonna be honest, usually when I reread an absolute favorite of mine, I am a little disappointed because I never enjoy it as much as the first time around. Firstly, because obviously it's gonna be less shocking than the first time around. You already know everything that's gonna happen. And secondly, most of my favorite books I read when I was a lot younger and I'm just afraid that I fall into the pit of I'm an adult now and I don't like YA books anymore. That's my fear and I don't want that to happen. <laughs> so I just don't reread the books. <laughs> but. I'm happy to say that I reread my favorite book of all time, Six of Crows, and I still liked it. Let's talk about it. And while I possibly butcher this drawing as it is right now, Six of Crows is a fantasy story, a fantasy crime story that takes place in this fantasy crime city <laughs> based on like 19th, 18th century Amsterdam. And we follow six main characters who go on this heist to break a very important figure out of prison, which is of course an impossible job, but they're gonna do it anyway because they're criminals and thieves and thugs anyway, and they just need the money. But mostly the story is just a vessel to getting to know the characters and all their backstory, etc., and the relationships that they have with each other. And just like the first time, this was so much fun. Mm, I am indeed ruining it. Oh well. Can't go back now. So, one of the reasons that I love this book is because it's exactly my thing. I love being in Ketterdam. I love this story where you follow these criminal characters, <laughs> these underdogs, these thieves going on like a crime mission, on a heist. I just always love those types of stories. They make me happy every single time. Just like the first time around, after just reading the first chapter, I was already hooked because it's just exactly my thing. And yet again, I also really liked the characters, although, let, hmm, how am I gonna tell this story? My general remarks are the same as the first time that I read it. I love the characters. I love the heist story. I love how it all comes together. I love the action scenes. There's a lot of epic moments. I like the banter between the characters. It's all still there and I still love it. However, the first thing, is that over time this book has kind of gotten i've gotten to know this book uh, and describe this book as like a, a book that's like super character focused and i totally understand if some people find it boring because there's barely any plot and it's just focused on the characters backstories rereading it i realized that that is bullshit there's a lot of plot in this book i don't know where i've gotten this idea <laughs> that Six of Crows is just a character-driven story with no plot and just flashbacks. No, like throughout the book, things are happening like all the time and it's very action-packed. So I don't know where I've somehow over the years created this idea that it is a plotless book. 
because the plot really carries the story as well as the characters. It's the perfect balance. <laughs> the second thing is that my appreciation of the character shifted a little bit. I like Nina a little bit more and I, I do realize now that Kaz... It, it, he... When I first read this book I was like, oh my god, Kaz, whoa ripping people's eyes out oh my gosh that was like the one of the worst things i'd ever seen happening in a book <laughs> i was like whoa this man is so evil he's such an interesting like mysterious morally gray character wow and now i reread it and i'm like okay he's kind of a caricature a little bit like a little bit like we're just constantly told how terrifying he is and like how smart and everyone's like afraid of him. This does feel a little bit over the top. A little bit. <laughs> like I didn't quite buy it the second time around. Yeah, I ruined this painting. I really did. Oh my. Sorry. Why did I do this? Lately when I draw characters I've been adding these little like swirlies <laughs> on the cheeks and the fingers and it usually looks really cute but not here <laughs> oh well <laughs> final verdict of six of crows i still love it it is still a five star read for me um and i want more books with like crime fantasy like this because i like that i will say the last thing i want to say about this book the first time i read it i of course hadn't read that many books yet. I remember when I first read this, this was like the height of morally great characters for me because it was just the first time that I really read a book where that was just kind of happening and we had all these like darker themes and more morally great characters, not just like goody two shoes heroes. And I thought it was like super like, whoa, like morally great. <laughs> and now that I've read a lot more of those kind of books, I realized that this is really not that. I mean, it, it, it is there, but it's really not that. I mean, I've read the Poppy War now. I'm not gonna blame the book for that. I mean, I know that that was never the intention of this book, but it's just interesting to kind of notice like how you view different books over time based on other books that you've read. The more other books you read, the different perspective you get on new books that you read. And I think that's interesting. So yeah, still love this. Uh, I'm currently still absolutely freaking obsessed with Shadow and Bone and the Grishaverse and everything else. If you want to know like my full thoughts on the show, I actually made like a whole video essay on it. I will link it up the screen uh, so you can watch that if you're into that. I think we're gonna finish up this drawing. I did not really get that much farther than where I started. This is what it looks like now. Is it better than before? A little. A little. Doesn't matter. I had fun being a little creative today. Let me know what you thought of this style of a reading wrap-up. <laughs> if you like this video, give it a like. And if you'd like to see more of my face, make sure to subscribe so you don't miss anything and hit the notification bell. Also follow me on Twitter and Instagram if you want if you want. I really hope you enjoyed this video and I will see you soon in another one. Goodbye!